So it's a, a case for a re rehearsal as well as the question we're being asked today. And of course, to know what caused the, uh, what might be ways to avoid the next crisis, it helps to understand what happened with the last one, of course, which the economics mainstream is completely clueless about. Uh, and they remain that way even after having experienced a crisis. Uh, and they continue to dismiss any explanation of the crisis that brings it back to the financial sector. Uh, my favourite example here is one a master's student of mine recently uh, uh, located for me, which is a Federal Reserve advisor, Leo Harnian, frequently publishes with the Nobel Prize winner uh, Prescott, Edward Prescott, and he dismisses the explanation that the financial sector had any role by saying when you look at the level of credit compared to GDP, it was an all-time high in 2008 and it's declined a bit in 2010, but still much higher than it was, for example, in the middle of 2008. Now, this is the chart he was using. and does say the ratio of bank credit, does use the word credit. However, what it actually is, is the level of private sector debt. Credit is properly defined as the rate of change of private sector debt. Now he's making an elementary mistake of confusing an outstanding stock of debt with the rate of change of debt per year. And he works with Nobel Prize winners. Okay. Now this is like mistaking distance for speed. So imagine you go in court, you've been arrested and you say to the judge, I was only 30 kilometres from Brussels, so I wasn't speeding. And the judge says back to you, you were doing 240 kilometres per hour, you were speeding. That's the nature of the mistake he's made there. Now how is it that a prominent expert in economics could make a mistake like that? And how is it the referees of the journal in which he published didn't point that mistake out to him? This is the Journal of Economic Perspectives, which is ranked in the top 10 of journals and it's published by the American Economic Association. By the way, it's open access, so I'd recommend taking a look at this, this article to see what I'm talking about here. So how could they make such a simple error? Well, the reason is mainstream neoclassical economics, as it's known, asserts that money does not have any real effects. Money affects the price rate, the price level, which is nominal. It doesn't affect employment, GDP, and so on. And they build models that emit, completely emit, the existence of banks and debt and money when they model the macro economy. That's like Ptolemaic astronomers trying to understand meteors when they don't understand gravity, let alone that the Earth is not, in fact, the centre of the universe. Uh, so they're so ignorant of monetary factors that they can make simple definitional mistakes like that without even knowing they're making them. So let's do it a bit better. Let's work from the data and I'll show you what he couldn't find. So here's the level of private sector debt compared to GDP in America from 1970. Okay. Let's look at the rate of change, which is actually the rate at which credit is being provided to the economy. This is the rate of change. I think I can see something there, can't you, in the data. There's it peaking at 15% of GDP before the crisis. There's it bottoming at minus six in the depths of the crisis. So that's obvious in the data that credit played a huge role. Something happened to credit in 2008. A 20% of GDP, 21% of GDP turnaround using that data. It's a different data series than he was using, but the same phenomenon. And this is now looking at, again, he said there was no way in which you could explain the increase in unemployment for what happened to credit, given the definition, or should I say, in fact, the Daffy notion that he has of credit. Let's look at now at actual credit and the unemployment rate. Now, there's such a strong relationship there, it almost looks like what psychologists used to impose on you back in the 1960s of a Rorschach test, okay? One goes up, the other goes down. So what's going on there? Well, basically, simply without explaining the logic um, to justify this now, rising credit boosts aggregate demand and causes falling unemployment. It's that simple. But it also causes private debt to grow faster than GDP, 
you reach a point where debt growth stops, at which point credit growth, credit falls and, and cash should become negative and reduce aggregate demand, and that's what causes a crisis in 2008 versus recessions in earlier years when you simply had a reduction in the level of credit without it actually turning negative. Now, that's not understand, understood by mainstream economists because they assume away the role of finance and the existence of instability as an inherent part of an economy. And the same factor applies to all the countries that had a crisis back in 2008, including the Eurozone ones. I know, of course, the obsession with the European Commission is with the level of government debt and what's happening there. What actually caused it is something they completely ignore, which is private debt and private credit. So here's the same data for Spain. There's the level of private debt in Spain from before the crisis to during. You can see that it, the, credit, the level of debt exploded from the beginning of the euro forward. Here's credit. In fact, a much higher positive and a much larger negative in Spain's case than in America's case. Very high credit before the crisis, negative during it. And then you look at the unemployment relationship and it's the same story. So while the European Commission obsesses about government debt, what's driving the crisis is private debt. Now, it even applies in Portugal. The level of private debt in Portugal, the rate of change of private debt, and the level of unemployment in Portugal. It even applies in Greece. So from high credit to negative credit, this is Greece coming up. A lower level of private debt overall but given the rate of change of private debt, a high level of credit before the crisis, negative credit during it, sustained as a reaction to the austerity policies being imposed upon Greece by the European Commission. So high credit before the crisis, negative credit during the crisis, and still sustained. Now countries that avoided a crisis back in 2008 did by stopping credit turning negative. This includes France. So here's the credit and unemployment relationship in France. You can see the credit was medium, not high, before the crisis, and it hasn't turned negative after the crisis. But the cost that France has paid for that is a high level of private debt now. So it's one of the countries I identify as likely to have a crisis in the future because it managed to avoid one in 2008 by continuing to drive up private debt. Or you can run a huge trade surplus. Why can't we all be like Germany? Okay. Because we can't all have a trade surplus, that's why. Okay. So Germany's had a very low level of private debt, in fact falling, and government debt falling as well. No apparent relationship between credit and unemployment because it is running a trade surplus of about 8.5% of GDP. If we could all do that, there wouldn't be a problem. We just have to open up trading uh, embassies, embassies on Mars, or maybe Venus. So low credit throughout, thanks to a high trade surplus, it's not a solution the rest of us can use. Now, with one slide I've added here to my presentation uh, is about why has the recovery been better in America than it's been in the Europe. It's because the recovery, and I've got it in inverted commas, has been driven by restoring credit growth. So this is now looking at America's level of private debt, which is the red line, and level of credit, which is the blue line. And you can see that, uh, that the blue line in America's case is higher than the one in Europe's case. There's been a recovery driven by positive credit in America. Europe is still pretty much at zero to negative credit in the aggregate. Of course, it's much worse in countries like Spain, Portugal and Greece, which are still in crisis mode thanks to the Europe, Eurozone policies. So that's why there's been a, re a relative recovery for America, not much of one for Europe. And my expectation for the American economy is the next re recession there will be caused by the Federal Reserve because they're run by economists like Ohanian who don't understand money at all, don't realise the importance of the level of private debt, and will now drive up interest rates as inflation starts to rise in America, as the labour market tightens to the stage where employers drive up wages to try to bring workers in 
because there's no way workers in America will dare bargain for wage rises themselves. They're terrified of being sacked, even with low unemployment. But as that happens, you might have the American economy having high interest rates. So it's not seeing, not seeing, I'm not expecting Donald Trump to go into austerity, obviously, certainly for his own lifestyle. Um, but I do expect the Federal Reserve to drive up interest rates. And what we might get is a repeat of what happened during the Great Depression. The red line now is the level of private debt during the Great Depression. The blue line is credit. And uh, on the left-hand graph and on the right-hand side, I have credit uh, as the red graph and the blue being the unemployment rate. Now you can see that the serious downturn of the Great Depression was caused by private sector deleveraging hitting up to 10% of GDP per year for several years. So a massive negative credit experience during the Great Depression, countered by the, by the New Deal. Roosevelt was then persuaded in 36-37 to attempt to go back to balance the budget, get the books back in order again. When he did that, you had the private sector returning to deleveraging again. So there's the massive increase in unemployment driven by the massive negative credit effect of the Great Depression itself. Then you have Roosevelt returning trying to return the government budget to surplus, driving the private sector into deficit, it went back into negative credit once more, and as a result of that, unemployment doubled. That's called the Roosevelt Recession. Most people aren't aware that there are actually two downturns during the Great Depression, not just one. Now, I think the Federal Reserve may well trigger a second experience of that, hopefully in time for Donald Trump's re-election campaign. So, why don't mainstream economists understand credit. This is the, really the basis of all the mistakes that have been made that led to the crisis and will set us up for ones in future. Well, they have a theory of banking in which banks don't originate loans. This is my good friend, Paul Krugman. You do understand sarcasm here, don't you? Good, okay. Yes. Um, where he he <laughs> explains, explains, I'm not, not an American audience, I need partners, with the exception of my colleague here. <laughs> Um, so if I say if I decide to cut back on my spending and stash the funds in a bank which lends them out to someone else, this doesn't have to represent a net increase in demand. That's Paul Krugman. He's a radical neoclassical. Neo okay? And therefore banks lend out deposits. They also start from the assumption that bank the money only affects prices. This is Robert Lucas when he made these comments was a, a maverick. He's been, it simply became a Nobel Prize winner in the president of the American Economic Association. The absence of money illusion implies that aggregate demand fluctuations of a purely nominal nature should lead to price fluctuations only. In other words, monetary changes just change the inflation rate. They don't change the level of output or the level of unemployment. And they model the economy as if it's in or near equilibrium and inherently stable. And this is now a Nobel Prize winner, Prescott, who invented what's called real business cycle models. Uh, giving his explanation of the Great Depression and saying why haven't we used neoclassical growth theory to study it, he says maybe because we've treated it as an aberration defying an equilibrium explanation. In other words, even the Great Depression was an equilibrium phenomenon according to neoclassical economists. Um, and they believe that private debt doesn't cause asset price changes in, and they actually encourage firms to get into as much debt as possible to use the interest rate deduction they get. So here's Medigliani and Miller, the famous hypothesis in economics, saying that leverage won't affect share prices because share buyers can be leveraged in the opposite magnitude to the companies they're buying shares in. So leverage doesn't affect asset prices. Well, let's go through all that bunkum. First of all, I'm delighted to say I can thank the Bank of England and the Bundesbank the Bundesbank, indeed, coming out and saying the mainstream model is false. Banks do not lend out deposits. Bank lending creates deposits. And the Bundesbank saying that there's a popular misconception that banks are just intermediaries. It is not a popular misconception. It is a misconception of the so-called experts. Okay. And money illusion is invalid where you have loans. No matter how you put it together, once you have debt in your, in your system, whether it's created by banks or individuals lending to each other, the size of the measuring stick changes as you change the price level. You cannot get away from money once you have credit, but that's what they ignore. 
So rather than being uh, the public being uh, being sensible and not suffering from money illusion, it's the economic profession that suffers from barter illusion. I believe they can they can model a modern capitalist economy as if it's a barter economy when we know our history of anthropology properly from people like David Graeber and Michael Hudson, barter has never existed. Okay. And the real world is always out of equilibrium. And one of the best quotes of this is from Irving Fisher, who after he made the mistake of believing in, in equilibrium theory himself and went bankrupt during the Great Depression, came out saying that new disturbances are always likely to occur, so any variable will always be above or below its ideal equilibrium. And it's as absurd to argue that the economy is in equilibrium as it is to assume that the Atlantic Ocean can ever be without a wave. And he then had a disequilibrium explanation for the Great Depression, which of course conventional economists like Ben Bernanke completely failed to understand because they think in equilibrium terms. So let's try to understand what the mainstream doesn't. I'm going to pretend a little uh, economy, it's be, divide the world into three sectors. So I'm just using a set of random names here, it's like Angela, Emmanuel and Alexis. And imagine they each have 100 euros in cash and they each spend 100 euros per year on each other, which gives us a GDP in this little notional economy of 600 euro per year. And I'm going to start with a world in which no borrowing is possible. So total expenditure of 600 billion, let's say, euro becomes total income of 600 billion. So the negatives are the spending by each of the entities. The positives are the income being received because of that spending. Each row necessarily sums to zero. If you sum up the negatives and take the opposite, you get the expenditure measure of a GDP, which is 600 billion. You sum up the positives, you get 600 billion. Expenditure is income. That's the essential identity in macroeconomics. Now, the rows necessarily sum to zero. The columns can be non-zero because your expenditure can be greater than your income or vice versa. But of course, the sum of all of them is also necessarily zero. And I really want people to get this into your heads and get this across to the thick heads of the people you're trying to convince about the nature of the economy. But there's no arguing with this. This is absolutely correct. Now, what does it lead to? Neoclassicals look at that and they say, well, credit doesn't play a role. So I'm now going to bring in their vision that Angela borrows from Emmanuel to spend on Alexis. Okay? There's, this is where banks are being intermediaries. If I brought banks in, they'd just be arranging a, a, a personal loan from Angela to Emmanuel. Uh, and Emmanuel then uh, finances the loan by reducing the amount of spending that he's doing on Angela and Alexis. So total expenditure here, you have 10 euro being borrowed by uh, Angela from Emmanuel and one dollar interest being paid by Angela to Emmanuel as a result. Well the interest, the one euro of interest is expenditure for Angela and it's income for Emmanuel. The 10 euro of credit cancels out because Emmanuel spending 10 less, Angela spending 10 more. So credit disappears. You do have an impact for the interest spending, but that's the only change. So the vision they have is that credit simply transfers spending power. It doesn't create new spending power. Now let's bring in the real world. I call this, we used to call this endogenous money. I'm trying to change it across to a new acronym, bank originated money and debt, otherwise known as BOMD. Okay. So Angela takes out a loan of 10 euro from the bank and pays 10% interest to the bank. And total expenditure is now 612. What's going on? Well, the first of all, the interest spent by Angela is income for the bank. And the bank then spends that interest back on the other two sectors. So it's income for those two sectors. So you get a two euro increase in income that way. But the credit does not cancel. The increased spending power by Angela on Alexis is not offset by decreased spending by anybody else because it's financed by the bank increasing its liabilities, which is what you're seeing here, and increasing its assets, the extra debt that Angela now owes to the bank. So that 10 euro of credit-based spending has added to aggregate demand and income. And that's what neoclassicals can't get their head around. 
nor your colleagues in the European Commission and European Union, uh, Parliament, I expect. Take them through this page. Okay? They, can't, they can't defeat this logic. So what you have is credit increases demand when it's positive and it reduces demand when it's negative. And if you ignore that, you're going to crash right into the next financial crisis. So how do you avoid one? Well, you don't let private debt get to be too high and you don't let credit become too big a factor in aggregate demand. And bad luck, you've done both. Okay. Private debt is now higher than it's been, I th think I can say fairly soundly, in the history of capitalism. I have long-term data for three Anglo-Saxon countries, US, UK and Australia. And if you go back to 1830 and come forward, there's never been a level of private debt to compare to where we are now. And of course, mainstream economics encouraged this explosion. So you can see in all cases in those three countries, the level of private debt now is higher than it's been at any time in their history. And this explosion occurred when mainstream economics was saying leverage is good. So they're hardly likely to back out of that assertion. Look what it says they've done to us. So we need to make finance the servant and not the master. And of course that implies in asset markets as well. So let's just dismiss that argument that, asset, that leverage plays no role in asset prices. The red line is margin debt as percentage of GDP in the USA. The blue line is the S&P index. Anybody spot a relationship? The causal one behind it is the change in margin credit and the change in asset prices. Again, it's, the data is overwhelming to saying there's a relationship. You have to be deliberately blind not to see that. But that is the case of mainstream economics. Same thing in housing, of course. This is looking at mortgage finance and the house price index in America. I'm sure Ohanian would look at the blue line diverging from the red and say, well, obviously there's no relationship. What drives it is the change in mortgage credit and the change in house prices. That's that relationship you can see there. And I can say emphatically, I know that the causal goes from predominantly from change in mortgage credit to change in house prices, not in the return direction. So our problem is that we still think about banks, even after all the behaviour in the last 20 years, as money custodians. And if you look at the way the mainstream models this, what they've got going on there is that uh, you have the, the saver lends to the borrower and there's no change in the liabilities of the banking sector when those liabilities are money. So there's no money creation by lending. But they're actually money factories. Okay? When you look at what they actually do, you have the, the lending increases their liabilities and increases their assets. They create debt and money at the same time. And of course they can create too much and they can make it for the wrong sort of thing. So c clearly I'm going to agree with my mainstream colleagues here, making money is hard when by that you mean making a profit or earning a wage. Making money when you're a bank is easy. It's just double entry bookkeeping. That's why it has to be controlled. Now, they can only make that money because they have a banking licence. Without a banking licence, they can't take deposits. Without being able to take deposits, they can't create deposits and create loans at the same time. So their capacity to, to be banks is a socially granted capacity. And that means society has the right to control where they create the money, whether it's for productive investment or speculation, and to reverse mistakes they've made with unregulated unre lending in the past, which is what they've clearly done this time round. So we could use the central bank's equivalent money creation capability to reverse the mistakes of the private banking sector. But instead what we've done, again because central banks have been controlled by mainstream economists, and they still dominate the Federal Reserve obviously, they're less influential on the Bank of England and thank God also the Bundesbank these days. But what they did is they used quantitative easing to rescue the banks from their own mistakes. In the United States, it was of the order of a trillion dollars per year. And I can go through the logic as to how that's inflated share prices if I have a discussion later. It's benefited banks and it's benefited those who own shares. But it's increased inequality, which is already extreme because of the financial crisis. The working class don't own many shares or the idea of share owning democracy is still a myth. Now you look at the, what that's done to the stock market, this is using 
uh, Robert Schiller's excellent capital, the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. The level of the stock market now without the sort of bubble that drove it in the 2000s with the, um, the telecommunications bubble and the dot-com bubble, it's the second highest in history. It's even higher than 1929. That's what QE has done. Now, we could have a people's QE, which would inject government central bank created money in, into the public's bank accounts on a per capita basis. So Rupert Murdoch would get the same amount of money that I would get out of this idea. And you can do it without moral hazard or without inflation because everybody gets it, so it doesn't reward those who speculated versus those who didn't. Those who have debt get an offset account that reduces their debt payments, their effective debt goes down. Those without debt get, get access to a fund that buys new corporate shares, where those corporate shares have to be used to reduce corporate debt. So you could both reduce the level of household and corporate sector debt, and to some degree democratise share ownership. Reduce the private debt burden and reverse the inequality of QE. That's feasible. And you could also, you have to of course, regulate the banks to stop the whole damn thing stopping over again. Stop them lending on assets alone, causing asset leverage and direct finance to industry rather than to property. You'd need to do all of those, but it is feasible. Now, I'm having very, I have zero expectation of that being done, and therefore what's likely to happen is what happened to Japan. Now, Japan was the canary in the coal mine of the global fi financial bubble. It, it had its bubble burst in 1990. Again, this is the same data as I've shown for the other countries. Red is private debt compared to GDP, peaking in Japan's case at about 225% of GDP. The blue line is credit. Now looking on the right hand side, the red line is now credit, peaking at about 30% of GDP when its crisis began, going down to minus 10, 15%. And the unemployment rate you can see is very, very low for Japan, but it's taken 25 to 30 years to get back to its pre-crisis level. Credit before the crisis averaged for that whole period 17% of GDP. So a huge credit base bubble was the basis of Japan when Japan was the rising sun. Since the crisis, it's averaged 0.6% of GDP, a trivial level of credit base demand. Now, 25 years to get back to sort of pre-crisis levels of private debt, 30 years to get back to pre-crisis level of unemployment. Do you think Europe can afford 30 years of that sort of situation? So, we have too high a level of private debt causing both the Great Depression and the Great Recession, and you can't understand them using the way the mainstream pretends to think about the economy. Uh, again, I think it's the Stolmach astronomy analogy is very good. If you believe the universe and the economy is stable and believe all instabilities caused by exogenous shocks, there's nothing you can do. Now, who on earth would call the financial sector exogenous except economists? Okay. They literally describe the financial sector as a source of exogenous frictions to the economy. And they're now including it as a source of frictions when it's actually a lubricant. So we need a new, what I'd call Copernican economics, which says the economy is inherently dynamic, finance is integral to the economy, and instability is inherent to the economy and driven by finance. That's fundamentally, that's Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. Now, Minsky was my inspiration to write a model uh, that I did back in 1992, published in 1995, which can be derived simply by taking the employment rate, uh, a measure of income distribution, which is the wages share of GDP, and the private debt to GDP ratio, dynamising them using extremely simple definitions where the rate of change of wages depends upon the employment rate, the level of investment depends upon the profit rate, and debt finances investment. So in this case, I'm looking at solely productive investment. And the outcomes where you can reach stability if private debt and credit remain low, but with a high level of private debt and credit, you will have a crisis. And oddly enough, the crisis is preceded by what looks like a great moderation. Now, I, this model was written two decades before the financial crisis began. Okay. And I finished off with what I thought was a nice rhetorical flourish. The chaotic dynamics explored in this paper 
should warn us against accepting a period of relative tranquility in a capitalist economy as anything other than a lull before the storm. I thought that was a nice piece of poetry. I didn't think it was a nice piece of, of, of um, uh, prophecy, but that's what it turned out to be. Now, when I run the model with a low level of desire to invest by capitalists, which is in some ways undesirable, you get the sort of convergence to equilibrium that neoclassical economists think applies in the real world, though this is using dynamics which they don't use. I'll see if I can just, if I have enough time, can I get my mouse working at a distance here? I can't, uh, I mean, no, I didn't get it, no, I'll come back to it. Okay. Now, when you have a high level of desire to invest, it gives you a very different pattern that looks like you're heading towards equilibrium, but then you don't. Now, in a very stylized way, everything that happened in the crisis is in that graph. Inflation and unemployment seem to be trending down and then exploded. Workers' share of GDP fell, meaning you have rising inequality. And it was all driven by an explosion in the level of private debt. So it's possible to model with the right sort of mathematics and the right sort of economics what we went through. But you won't get that being done by universities and funding agencies who are still far too dominated by mainstream economic thinking, even after the crisis. And in my opinion, you have to work outside the universities to get change at the moment. Institutions like the OECD, the Bank of England, are more likely to bring up mod modern approaches to economics which are realistic because they're on the front line when things go wrong. Academics can go back inside their cubby holes and ignore it all, which is what they're doing. Now, fortunately, students are making it hard for them to do that, so I please recommend you to support the Rethinking Economics movement. Those students are still annoying their professors, and that's a damn good thing. And for myself, I'm giving up on the university sector ultimately, and I'm turning to crowdfunding. And uh, hopefully we can get an economics that might at least give us a better warning of the crisis as the next one approaches. Thank you. Thank you so much. And especially for keeping the time, we still have uh, good time for discussion.